It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 37th Polius Lecture on Higher Education. I'm Melora Sunt, the Executive Vice Dean for the Rossier School of Education. Our Dean, Dr. Karen Sims Gallagher, was called away because of the impending birth of her first grandchild. So we wish her and the soon-to-be new parents well. The Pullius Lecture is one of the annual events out of the USC Rossier School, of which I'm most proud and always most eager to attend. Today will be a highlight in the lecture's proud history because it features one of the most significant and nationally recognized voices in our country. Janet Napolitano is one of America's groundbreakers. She has been the first woman to serve in a number of offices, including Attorney General of Arizona, Secretary of Homeland Security, and now President of the University of California. In 2012, Forbes ranked her in the top 10 of the world's most powerful women, and many have suggested that she should be appointed to the US Supreme Court or run for president. But before she does that, she has graciously agreed to speak to us today. Her presentation is titled, A Trifecta for the Future, Higher Education, California, and Innovation. Thank you for being with us, President Napolitano. To begin the afternoon, I'm honored to welcome and introduce a most distinguished member of the audience, the President of the University of Southern California, C.L. Max Nikias. Thank you for joining us, Mr. President. And from the USC Provost's Office, I'd like to introduce Vice Provost for Graduate Programs, Sally Pratt, and Vice President for Undergraduate Programs, Jean Bickers. And finally, a special welcome to Virginia Fifner, classes of 55 and 72, who was a student of Earl V. Pullius, for whom this lecture is named. <laughs> Earl V. Pullius was Professor Emeritus of Higher Education here at USC. After a storied academic career at universities across the nation, he came to USC in 1957 to establish the Department of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. Dr. Pullius was guided by a passion to pursue the philosophical issues in higher learning, and he published more than 100 research and theoretical articles and reviews. His book, A Teacher is Many Things, has been translated into nine languages. The Pullius Lecture, dedicated to his memory, was arranged to bring a nationally recognized scholar to USC who would augment department programs for faculty and students. The publication of these lectures is intended to add to the ongoing academic dialogue on significant topics in higher and post-secondary education. We are very grateful to the family of Earl V. Pullius for making not only this lecture series possible, but also for endowing USC Rossier's Pullius Center for Higher Education. As the Executive Vice Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, this is my opportunity to brag a little bit about the work of the Pullius Center and its co-directors, Bill Tierney and Adriana Kizar. Dr. Tierney is a university professor, one of our institution's most prestigious designations. He is the Wilbur Kiefer Professor of Higher Education and also Rossier's Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs. He is the past president of the American Education Research Association, a fellow in the National Academy of Education, and is a visiting fellow at the University of Hong Kong, where he contributes to their higher education policy studies. The Pullius Center's co-director, Adriana Kizar, is also a national figure in higher education. Her research in higher education governance and the professoriate is regularly cited, and she is one of the nation's most quoted experts on the role of the adjunct faculty. I know that Dr. Tierney intends to tell you a bit more about the current exciting work of the Pullius Center, so I will now turn to him. Dr. Tierney. Hello, everyone. Some of you know that I was um, raised in an Irish Catholic family, and Lent is around the corner, so I've been thinking a lot about Lent. And on Holy Saturday, we would go to evening mass, and I can remember Monsignor O'Brien, the personification of dower, always saying at the end of Saturday evening's mass that he had a secret for us, only for the parishioners who had attended the service. 
he said that we could break the fast and we could go home and eat meat for the first time since Lent had begun. Now, as a little guy, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, that 9 o'clock at night on a Saturday, we would be eating bacon and sausages and ham and eggs. For some reason, it was just great. So I have a few secrets for the Pullius parishioners. But we can't get beyond this room because it's only for us. As some of you know, I've been helping Karen for the last several months. And I have learned that the folks I'm working with in faculty affairs and research are the best in the university. Now that's a secret, so no tweeting. I don't want any other school to be stealing any of my staff, especially Michael Chung or Catherine Dunyata. Now something that's not a secret is in November, uh, we got a first in the world grant for three and a half million dollars to extend our work on games and social media. The secret here is what I have said all along, and that was that my first decision was actually my best decision, and that was hiring Zoe Corwin to lead the initiative. And I don't want people to know about that either, because I don't want her to leave the university doing something else. There is a book out with Johns Hopkins Press that she and I have edited, and we were just at the university across the freeway helping them understand what we're doing. Now, I've never thought of my co-director, Adriana Kizar, as competitive, but I no sooner get three and a half million dollars than two months later, she announces that she's about to get seven million dollars. And I can't, we haven't signed the deal yet, so I can't tell you which foundation it is of a very rich individual in a very cold state, but we'll announce that in a, a week or two. So it's a secret just for you, but three and a half million here, seven million there, it begins to add up. And Adriana was also just elected a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, and that says two things. First, under Karen's leadership, the Rossier School is in the top five of faculty fellows per tenure track faculty members. The second point is, we need more tenure track faculty members. So stay tuned on that. On an international level, Professor Malguizo has returned from her sabbatical at the Paris School of Economics. Professor Cole is back from his sabbatical in Singapore at the National University. And I will leave in a few months to go back to Hong Kong. All of these nice things, of course, only matter because we are trying to be a center of impact. We're trying to help create a more just world through improving access and equity for low-income first-generation youth and understand what that means theoretically, institutionally, by the use of social media. That's what defines us. Which brings me to today's speaker. Rarely have I introduced someone who really doesn't need an introduction. Former Attorney General of Arizona, former Governor of Arizona, a member of the Obama administration, and the, a Secretary of Homeland Security, a lawyer by training, and now the 20th President of the University of California. And if that's not enough for you, she's also climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Today's talk is in keeping with former Pullius lecturers. We've had Clark Kerr, David Gardner, and Richard Atkinson as former speakers. So I am delighted to introduce the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. Yeah, all right. It is indeed an honor to be here to present the 37th Pullius Lecture. Uh, you might suspect that it's a bit of a Nixon to China moment for me, the president of the University of California, <laughs> home to Bruins and Bears, uh, venturing into the heart of Trojan country. But as Bill suggested, there is precedent. David Gardner, the 15th president of the University of California, delivered the 1986 installment of this prestigious lecture series. And Richard Atkinson, the 17th UC president, did the same in 1997. And now you have me, number 20, uh, uh, and um, uh, pleased and honored to be here. Now in his lecture, President Gardner 
addressed a nascent global transformation that he forecast would internationalize both the creation of and the quest for knowledge and, and ultimately alter the reach and mission of American research universities. He was a prescient man. The technological advances and economic shifts of the past three decades have only accelerated the changes President Gardner saw coming. At UC, we are waist deep in efforts to keep the university ahead of the curve in research, in instruction, and in public service as the forces of change and realignment reshape the world at large. President Atkinson, in his Polius lecture, discussed the migration of research activity in America away from private enterprise, the Bell Lab model, if you will, and into the realm of research universities, both public and private. He was of the view that research, particularly university research, is not truly understood, and therefore it is not appreciated by the public at large. He closed his lecture with remarks that seem eerily current today. Because what he said was this, I'm quoting, we need to have a passionate conversation about higher education in California. This conversation, he said, should encompass more than just the role of research universities in economic growth, though that remains a critical topic for California, but this conversation should also recognize that the discovery and application of knowledge are not at the periphery, but at the heart of what research universities are about. To remind Californians of that fact is not to devalue any other mission of the university, it's simply truth in advertising." Close quote. So at this point, having read that lecture, I found myself tempted to simply add what he said, <laughs> and then call it a day. Um, but as it turns out, the close of President Atkinson's lecture provides an apt starting point for me to share the main message I want to bring with you or bring to you this afternoon. And the message is this. We need to have a passionate conversation about higher education in California today. And in particular, that conversation needs to focus on the unique role research universities have played in making California a bastion of innovation and a world leader in its own right. California was given just one great gold rush. The world rushed in and almost overnight it seemed California found itself on course to become the nation's quote, great exception, to borrow a phrase from a wonderful social commentator, Carrie McWilliams. McWilliams, by the way, is a USC law grad of 1927. <laughs> but the easy pickings, the gold, it was gone in a relative flash. And in the 165 years that have followed, Californians have done the hard work of building and nurturing an iconic society known to the world as a beacon of progress and of hope and of opportunity. They built it with a native creativity and ceaseless innovation, introducing to the world everything from the silicon chip to fine Napa Valley wine to the wetsuit. They built it with a strong sense of common purpose fostering a true commonwealth where those with dreams and ideas and notions about the next big thing found themselves on equal footing with those born to privilege. And in the spirit of a commonwealth, they built it with a deep commitment to education and research, particularly public education. And that commitment in time would give rise to the 10 campus University of California, to the Cal State system, to the California community colleges, as well as to private universities such as USC and Stanford and Caltech and the Claremonts of the world. These were the institutions that in large measure produced 
the innovators, and propelled the innovation. Collectively, these were and still are California's best idea. So let's turn to the present and to the urgent and still unabated need for the conversation President Atkinson proposed in his Pullius Lecture of 1997. Today, and we have double checked this so you can write it down, the University of California is funded by the state in constant dollars at the same level as it was in 1997, the very year President Atkinson came here to plead for a better public understanding of the myriad and vast contributions research universities make to California. At the same time, and with that same level of funding, the University of California educates 75,000 more students today than it did in 1997. Same level of funding, 75,000 additional students. That's the statistical equivalent of adding an additional UCLA and UC Berkeley into the mix without receiving one more dime from the state. I find this to be a startling fact, and I believe it tells us many things. One thing it tells us is that, as I referenced earlier, the need for the urgent and passionate conversation about higher ed in California that Atkinson referenced has not gone away. It has only grown. But there are other implications in this statistical compass point. For starters, there are national trends at work. There are trends involving demographics, competing priorities, economics, and diluted faith, diluted faith in the common purpose. Put another way, nobody in this country just suddenly woke up and said, let's stop funding public education or public universities. It happened over time. But there are only so many taxpayer dollars to go around, and public higher education finds itself competing with things like health services, public safety, corrections. So uh, as it came to pass in the recent recession, the recession that began basically in 08, 30 out of 50 states whacked their state university budgets. Not haircuts, it whacked them. In California alone, nearly $1 billion in funding for UC was cut after the economy went into free fall. Put another way, California cut its funding for the University of California's core budget by 30%. And only a small portion of that has been restored as we recover. So the state um, continues to be in the midst of cuts made during the recession, even as the university has continued to meet increased demand and increased enrollment. Also contributing to this need for this urgent conversation and action, and we'll get to that, has been a societal drift away from the concept of a commonwealth. Taxpayers who used to view education at the University of California as a public investment increasingly now see it as a private good, one that ought to be paid for by those individuals who derive a direct benefit from it, the students, rather than as a public good to be provided by the state for the state. Now, as educators, we might and should disagree passionately with that view. And we might come to the conversation with a quiver full of proof points demonstrating how research universities touch and transform individual lives as a whole, far beyond campus borders. But as advocates, as advocates, we should know going in that this is not as simple or as easy a case to make as we would like to believe. Now, there are a few more points more granular in nature to be extracted from the fact that the University of California today educates 75,000 more students than it did in 1997 with the same level of state support. 
First, despite the rising national clamor about the increased costs of college, the cost, and I'm using that word now in quotes, of educating a student from freshman year to graduation has not, in fact, gone up. In fact, our numbers at the university suggest that the cost of producing a degree has been flat or even diminished for some time. Our numbers are actually supported by external studies, including those from the ongoing National Delta Cost Project and the California-based PPIC. So one factor contributing to that flat cost curve, like how do we do this, one factor is positive. As administrators, as educators, we've become more efficient. At the depth of the recession, for example, UC launched an initiative called Working Smarter. That to date has created more than $660 million in annual savings and improved fiscal performance. The quest for efficiencies in a public institution is a perpetual task. It's like repainting the Golden Gate Bridge. It never is finished. So after arriving in the fall of 2013, I launched an ongoing efficiency review of my own in the central office uh, because in this environment, every dollar that can be saved must be saved and every potential stream of new revenue must be explored. But waste and cost are not interchangeable terms. Blindly cutting costs for cutting sake can lead to a loss of quality. At the University of California, it you know, sometimes feel as though our challenge from the state is somehow to cut our way to excellence. Serving 75,000 more students at a 1997 level of funding makes it more and more difficult to preserve, let alone enhance, the academic excellence that has long been the secret sauce in UC's re recipe for success. The professor to student ratio becomes stressed. There are fewer instructors and more students per class. And there is greater difficulty for students to secure the classes they need to graduate on time. Rock star professors and researchers who serve as magnets to attract more of their kind become tougher to recruit and once on board, tougher to retain. Needed maintenance gets deferred. And in a seismically challenged state such as California, neglecting the facilities for too long can prove to be a risky business. And finally, yes, there is the matter of tuition. So let's talk about it. There is a tendency to conflate the term rising tuition with increasing cost. What has changed at the University of California, as I noted earlier, is not the cost of producing an education. It is the amount of that cost borne by students. In other words, a UC education was never free. It's just that with a strong Commonwealth spirit, taxpayers in previous eras underwrote that cost almost in full. They no longer seemed inclined to do so. And my sense is that elected officials are fully aware of that disinclination. So that's why, in relatively short order, the amount paid by our students has come to actually exceed the contribution from the state in the University of California's core budget, 46% to 42%. That's a startling marker of where we are today, a public university where the students invest more than the state in their school. Now let me clarify. When it comes to tuition, there is the sticker price, and then there's what's paid going out the door, so to speak. Our annual tuition now stands just north of $12,000 a year. So to put that in perspective, that price of four years at UC is roughly equivalent to what students would pay for one year at an Ivy League school or um, at Stanford or even at USC. <laughs> Had to say it. Um, 
That price is also about what families might pay uh, for a nicely equipped Ford pickup. And in a, in a degree, unlike an F-150, does not depreciate the moment you drive it off the lot. In fact, the opposite is true, and it remains true for life. That said, half of the university's tens of thousands of California resident undergraduates pay no tuition at all. For those whose families who earn $80,000 in annual income or less, their tuition is fully covered through a financial aid program that blends university-generated scholarship money with state and federal grants. It's called the Blue and Gold Opportunity Plan. I, I know I'm in red and gold territory. Ours is called the Blue and Gold Opportunity Plan. And as the promise embedded in this plan has seeped into consciousness of more and more California communities, it has helped push our application rates to record levels year after year. This financial aid guarantee uh, means that our student bodies are increasingly filled with a large percentage of Californians who are the first in their uh, families to attend college. Fully 42% of our undergraduate students are first-generation students. That's roughly 79,000 students. And hopefully, as those students graduate and later go on to start families of their own, they won't be the last in their families to attend college. This is how a society transforms itself, individual by individual, family by family, community by community. And this suggests to me strongly that a robust University of California provides something far greater than a private good to those who attend one of our campuses. Add in the matter of creating new knowledge through research and moving those innovations born of that research to a market, and you will and the university's value to the state expands by limitless multiples. So the stakes are very, very high when it comes to the University of California. And given both those stakes and the, and the hits we took in the recession, the stewards of the university, myself included, have come to the conclusion that action is demanded. With that in mind, this past November, we at UC made the difficult decision to move forward with a new tuition and financial aid plan the plan would add 5,000 more California undergraduates to the university. It would invest and reinvest in academic quality. And it will ensure a necessary and currently absent stability to the budget setting process for the university. Critically, we look to a longer horizon line than just the next budget cycle when we formulated the plan. The plan is capped at a 5% tuition increase for each of five years, but this is only a contingency. The state can reduce or eliminate those increases with additional funding. In other words, reinvesting what was taken away. In fact, it's a very infinitesimal part of California's $113 billion budget that would eliminate a need for any tuition increase at all. So today, while I am here, members of my staff are testing, testifying before the State Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee. I'm engaged in meetings with the governor. The UC Regents have appointed the governor and myself as a select advisory committee of two. We call it CO2. Um, and, uh, in my discussions with state leaders, including the Speaker of the Assembly and the President Pro Tem of the Senate, I am optimistic that a collective process will end in a good place, not just for the University of California, but for all Californians. The Regents and I are serious about maintaining the affordability of a UC education. We are also serious about maintaining the quality of a UC education. And we are serious about increasing the enrollment of California undergraduates. The Select Advisory Committee discussions are significant and in depth. They represent a serious collaboration between me and the governor. Because these discussions are still underway, 
And because the legislature has really just begun its work, we're just beginning the hearing process now, I'm announcing today that the University of California will not implement the tuition increase for the summer quarter. We are postponing this quarter as a gesture optimistic about the ongoing negotiations and how they will bear fruit. It is our conviction that all parties engage in these negotiations want tuition to be as low as possible and as predictable as possible. Moreover, as a matter of fairness, we want potential summer quarter students to enroll free from any uncertainty and unpredictability inherent in what is a fluid and still unresolved budget situation. We've sent out the appropriate notices and we are gratified by the many legislators who have expressed support for increased funding for the University of California and for higher education generally in California, including CSU and the community colleges. It is my most fervent hope that we will be able to reach a funding accord with Sacramento that will be sufficient to forestall any in-state tuition increase for at least the next academic year, but that will enable us to continue to provide the amount of and the quality of education that the UC is famous for. In a larger sense, our negotiations with the state over funding are not about just dollars. They are about a down payment on California's future. Full investment in the university is ultimately a full investment in the California dream. You see, there's only one thing worse than charging families more money to send their children to the University of California, and that is providing a University of California education that is of deteriorating quality. It is a decline in the robust research that, beyond the new knowledge it creates, is integral to the education experience at a research university. It is putting the university on a pathway to mediocrity that in time will ripple out through the California economy, through California's society, and ultimately may tear asunder the very notion of the California dream itself. So we are really in a struggle, uh, and that's why this is such an important conversation to be having in our state for what makes California what it is. My peers at California's great private research universities certainly know this. A few months ago, Tom Rosenbaum, the president of Caltech, and Stanford president John Hennessy co-published a piece in the San Francisco Chronicle that made what at first blush might seem to be a counterintuitive point. This is a quote. You might think, they wrote, that as the presidents of Stanford and the California Institute of Technology, we might view UC campuses primarily as rivals. That this is not so. Our campuses are partners in making the state of California the economic and innovation powerhouse it is today. The piece continued, quote, as research universities, the University of California, Stanford, and Caltech and here let me add USC, all undertake basic research and translate the discoveries into products and companies powering an engine of innovation and economic growth. Universities act as magnets for talent, making California schools the destination of choice for many of the most creative people in the world. The inventions, medical breakthroughs, and products that emerge from their research benefit communities across California and beyond. And then they wrote this. Much of the world-class research conducted on our campuses is inextricably linked, inextricably linked with research emanating from the University of California. If California is to remain an economic dynamo, then it needs the full capability of its research universities to be well supported. If California is to remain an economic dynamo, it needs the full capability of its research universities supported. There are 10 UC campuses, all public research universities in their own right, uh, and there are three major private research universities in California. We are all in this together. 
That's why earlier this afternoon when I met with President Nikias, we discussed ways uh, in which the leaders of these California research universities can work together to advocate, to lead the conversation about the unique contributions that research universities uh, bring not only to California, uh, but to our nation and indeed to the world, and what the unique education experience is that is provided at a research university. Um, we already collaborate in several ways. Um, USC and UCLA, to name one example, co-run the Center on Biodemography and Population Health, Health, which is housed on both campuses. The goal is to understand better the demographic trends and differences in population health. And this collaborative effort is making important strides in this research arena. There's another partnership between UCLA, UC Irvine, and USC to develop and refine new treatments for stroke prevention, acute therapy, and post-stroke recovery. Stroke is actually the leading cause of death in LA County. So two years ago, the three schools, UCLA, Irvine, and USC, received an NIH grant to research together important new treatments. And then just this past August, UCLA, Caltech, and USC received a three-year, multi-million dollar NSF grant to facilitate a technology and innovation hub in Southern California. The new center will offer training for faculty, provide guidance for university-bred startups, and connect those within our universities to investors on the outside. We may hash it out on the football field as spirited rivals, but when it comes to research and to education, the relationships between these research universities, public and private, are far more seamless and symbiotic. Collaborative efforts that pair the private sector with the academic world, generate new ideas, and drive innovation are nothing new in California. So consider the story of James Lick told by Kerry McWilliams in his book, The Great Exception. Lick was something of an eccentric. He came to California from Pennsylvania two years before the discovery of gold, and he began buying real estate. Smart man. At one point, Lick owned both Santa Catalina and Lake Tahoe. Now, for reasons unknown, he became obsessed with the stars and the cosmos. And a year before he died in 1875, he donated $700,000 to the University of California with a single string attached. The string was this. The university was required to build an observatory on Mount Hamilton just above San Jose. It would be the first observatory in California. So before the century was out, the University of Southern California was in pursuit of its own observatory to be built on Mount Wilson. That pursuit was inspired by a $50,000 gift from a Los Angeles booster named Edward Spence. If Northern California had an observatory, Spence reasoned, Southern California has, must have one as well. The work on Mount Wilson and the scientists it attracted to the San Gabriel Mountains and Valley Below ultimately led to the founding of Caltech to be followed by its nearby neighbor, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And this was the point of McWilliams' book, The Great Exception. California, early on, moved away from exploitation of its natural resources and reshaped itself as a state and economy and a society built on research, creativity, and innovation. And at the center of this reshaping were institutions like the University of California and the University of Southern California. So let's be realistic. This state is never going to be a smokehouse state. It's never going to be a call center state. It's never going to be a warehouse state. And those certainly should not be our aspirations. California, if it is to pay its dream forward to future generations, must never abandon its sense of itself as a society 
built on innovation, and it must never abandon the institutions that seed that innovation. California, the innovation state, is the California those who follow the gold rush set out to build. And it is the California their successors fostered across ensuing generations. That is the topic or the reason for the urgent conversation, because that is the California that we are fighting for. Thank you for your attention and for the honor of being with you this afternoon. And dare I say it, fight on. Are there some questions for President Napolitano? public view and also in popular press. All we see is UC education cost is going up and up and up, but nobody talks about the exact uh, constant cost aspect at all. So you made a very nice um, argument, but why is it not shown to the public? Because yeah. at least you have to reach out to the public to not have that kind of a negative consequences. Yeah. Um, well, you're the public. Um, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> We have been making this point uh, a lot. And it's a really hard point to get over. It's a little counterintuitive uh, because uh, people equate um, increased tuition. Well, your cost must be going up. There's no other reason for it. We have to punch home. No, the costs have not gone up. Uh, and the data is overwhelming in this regard. The only reason tuition's going up is because the priorities of the state have flipped. Um, and so we look for any opportunity to make that point. Uh, uh, our most important audience, uh, in a way, right now is Sacramento. Uh, but even getting students to understand that point is difficult. Um, and uh, I've very, been very pleased by both the, the Daily Bruin and the Daily Cal uh, uh, student papers, because they've, they have now latched on to this and understand that, that um, uh, if, if we are to continue to be able to deliver the quality product we want to, to the numbers who are out there, um, it's pretty simple. There's two main ingredients of the core budget. Uh, it's tuition and state support. Let me make another point, though, because I, I, I use another phrase, core budget. Um, that's, that's what we think of as uh, the operational cost, the teaching, the classroom, uh, for undergraduate uh, and, and to some degree graduate students. Uh, obviously, philanthropy is going up, um, but most of our th philanthropy, almost all of it, is very directed. Uh, so we can't use it in the same way. Um, and uh, research monies, as a research university, uh, we're very uh, productive, uh, but research dollars are primarily federal dollars, and federal research dollars have stagnated, which is a bad thing for the country. Um, so uh, there, there hasn't been a lot of uh, growth area there. So all of these things go into the, into the pie. What is the role of the community colleges in helping you achieve that goal? Well, the way um, uh, uh, the California ma master plan, and California, unlike any other state 50 years ago, actually um, understood that there are different types of higher education institutions um, and uh, al aligned them in three pillars, two-year community colleges, the Cal State universities, which are comprehensive, uh, and then the UC, which are the research PhD granting uh, institutions. And the way the master plan is, is written, uh, it, it presumes basically that uh, for every two freshmen we take, 
there will be one community college transfer. Um, and we're basic, we're a little bit below that now, but not by much. Um, if people want us to take more students from the community colleges, uh, then we have to be able to increase enrollment. Otherwise, what happens is a zero-sum game, and now you're closing a seat that would have gone to uh, a true freshman. Uh, and so, uh, in, in order to achieve kind of, you know, uh, some uh, adjustment on the edges, increase to some level uh, transfer students, there has to be an overall enrollment growth plan. And I'll just uh, end my answer by saying that this year for um, uh, a Every year, that I think, in, in years past, we had a record number of applicants from California for admission. I think it was up over 6% over last year in terms of applicants. Uh, so the demand is really there. Um, and there are lots of very good students that we would love to be able to um, offer a seat to. UCLA is really forward forward thinking in terms of getting this diversity requirement passed and I really I commend you on that but you're getting some pushback from faculty and some of the students where do you see things headed with uh, the diversity requirement and what role does diversity play in your definition of excellence and quality I think um, uh, in terms of the curriculum at each of our campuses um, that is um, left within the jurisdiction of the chancellor, the provost, and faculty at that particular uh, campus. And I know um, UCLA is having some robust discussions in, in this regard. With respect to um, uh, enrollment, excellence, diversity, uh, um, I, I see them as all blended together. Um, I, uh, uh, I believe that we are going to continue to see increased representation of historically underrepresented groups on our campuses, even despite the, the bar of 209, uh, which we are subject to. Um, for the second uh, year in a row, uh, we, have, uh, we had more Latino students begin as freshmen um, than white students. Um, and I think we're going to see that demographic trend continue. Um, one area that uh, is an issue for the country, for all schools, is the percentage of African Americans who are getting a higher education. It's dropping all over the place. Um, and um, I don't know that anyone has, and there, if there were a simple answer, it would have been discovered by now. Um, so to me, this requires a very comprehensive approach looking at a lot of factors uh, and really drilling down, are there things we can do um, within the confines of 209, but are there things we can do uh, to ensure that um, African American students know um, that the doors of the UC are open to them and they are, well, you know, they are more than welcome uh, there, as in all institutions of higher education. But it, I was just reading an article today about some national numbers here, and uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very disturbing national trend that ought to trouble us all. One last question. Make it a good one, Ron. Okay. <laughs> I was just wondering what some of your thoughts were about UC's role in dealing with uh, society's intractable social problems, because mm -hmm. you've talked a lot about social, I mean, economic innovation, but I was wondering, uh, what you think going forward UC's role would be in dealing with some difficult social intractable problems that we're all seeing and dealing with? You know, um, it's, it, you know it's interesting. When you talk about innovation, it's easy to um, move more into STEM-like fields because th they seem to have more tangible things. You know, you, you develop a better medicine or you develop a better piece of software or... Uh, you develop a new uh, 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 energy uh, uh, efficient uh, material or building design. But when I think of 
innovation. I think it is a much more inclusive term. Uh, and it also deals with and should be thought of in a broader context. And uh, uh, issues about uh, uh, education, issues about poverty, um, issues about long-term sustainability, issues about economic inequality. These are not issues that permit of a widget to solve or a treatment protocol or a medicine, but they are issues that uh, require multiple disciplines um, to be collaborating, to be piloting different strategies, to be uh, evidence-based and data-driven in terms of discerning what are some pol policy options that make sense, um, and that uh, are pay-it-forward issues in the sense that um, there is no solution to, you know, the next day, but these are long-term issues, and so these are, the, these are the sorts of things that not only should be engaging faculty, but students uh, as well. Um, and so when I think of innovation, I think of it much, uh, much more inclusively uh, than um, uh, uh, most people, I think, speak about. They may think about, but speak about. Um, and uh, the other thing I think residential universities do uh, is offer 18 to 22-year-olds um, the opportunity not only to be in a classroom with, but to live with students of all different backgrounds and types, uh, and hopefully garner some great benefit uh, from that and some understanding uh, uh, of those differences and how they, um, uh, uh, and how interactions between people um, occur. So I think in both of those ways, the modern public research university is a, a unique institution, uniquely positioned uh, to help society move forward. It's one of the things that attracted me uh, to taking over as the president of the University of California. Because when you think of, well, where do you want to invest you know, your time, your intellect, whatever talents you might have, but w where can you see them uh, being able to uh, build on and teach the next generation and, and help in that process. Um, and to me, a, a, a research university, a university particularly like the UC, 42%, you know, first generation, over 40%, low income, et cetera, you can just see the change that, that um, it supports. So it becomes a very fulfilling uh, life's work as as well as a wonderful institution. Thank you. Okay, to the parishioners, thank you for coming. There's food in the back. President Napolitano, President Nikias will be here for a few minutes if you'd like to talk with them. Thank you all for coming. Again, thanks, President Napolitano.